giant on a table. We want you to write down groups that you want other people to know about. We make sure all of that goes out in our notes. If there are any events that you want people to know about, please also write those down back there so that we can make sure those go out in the notes as well. Um, we, we do take notes. We actually take lots and lots of notes. Who here is getting the notes from this series? All right, and uh, it's okay if you haven't read them, but I'm just curious, has anyone read the notes? Okay, if you have not gotten the notes and you would like to, leave me your name and email on the yellow piece of paper here on the table. Um, that's the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition list. Chris Wood also has a list for bail. So I recommend signing up for both. But if you want the notes, write them down on that piece of paper. The other way to get them is if you are a part of the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition list serve, I also post them there. So if you want to just get them off the list serve, you can do that. On May 8th, we are hosting a seventh soil series. We just can't stop. Um, the, the last one is May 20, or April 24th, it's in two weeks. And um, two weeks after that, we're gonna have the seventh one. There won't be any speakers. It'll be three hours long. And at that event, we're gonna plug everybody into action. We've learned a lot, we've learned a lot from you. We're taking really good notes, including your questions, your statements, your interests, things you're already doing. And we're gonna work together to plug people in and get active. Sharing information is great, and meeting you all is wonderful, but we need to start working together. Um, and let's see, what else did I? Oh, our sponsors have been flashing behind me on the screen here. We have um, 23 businesses, farms, organizations, um, that have stepped up to support this. And what I wanna share with you there is I sent out one email to about 19 people saying, hey, do you wanna speak at this event? And I sent out another email to about 25 people saying, hey, do you wanna sponsor this event? And almost everyone said yes to both emails. So that's really good. Um, we've, we've hit something that people are excited about and I'm so glad you all could be here. So I'm gonna turn it over to our panel and I feel like you guys are really far away over there. Um, we are, we're gonna have, each of these guys are gonna speak for about seven minutes. Boom, boom, boom. You're gonna see some slides, a little bit of film and then after they're done, we're gonna get into a circle and have a discussion. So Mindy Blank is our first speaker. Do you wanna stand or? Um, might be easier for everyone to see you. There you are. <laughs> Mindy Blake. Hi. I haven't decided yet whether I'll use this microphone or not. Yeah. I'm gonna. We want you to. I will. Okay, I will. I have decided. <laughs> Good. Okay. You just heard all the words. Right all the way. Cool. Right so. no. <laughs> Kat will give you the instructions on how to do this. Yes. Ice cream cone. Ice cream. Yeah. Ice cream. Ice cream. Yeah. Superstar, rock star. Um, so, welcome. Welcome, welcome. This is a wonderful series that Kat and Chris have put together, and I'm so grateful to be part of it. And I just, I want to say, this is the most important work that we can really be doing right now, is resilience building locally. And so by being here, you are part of doing this incredibly important work. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about that link between soil health and community resilience. And first I want to set the context for this with a little bit of background on the organization that I'm part of called Community Resilience Organization. And this, this is a nonprofit that's mainly based in Vermont, but we also work a little bit throughout the rest of New England. Um, and it is living evidence that really beautiful, wonderful things can come out of terrible disasters. Community Resilience Organizations is a product of Tropical Storm Irene. Um, the founder of the organization, Peg Elmer, she was living in South Royalton at the time, uh, and 
um, she was teaching at Vermont Law School. She was teaching hazard mitigation planning, and she was also working at the state level, doing all sorts of hazard mitigation planning and helping the state prepare for climate change events. And her house was decimated during Tropical Storm Irene, which she was doing really hit home, literally. And so as she was looking around the state, she was, she was observing communities that bounced back faster than others. And then some communities took a really long time, took years to recover from Irene and from the destruction. <coughs> so she was wondering what it was about these communities that bounced back faster. And what she determined, looking around the state, what it was that it was communities that were more tight-knit and had closer relationships, and people knew their neighbors. And that won't come as a surprise to many of you, but that is just the reality. And so she built this organization based on that concept that to survive and thrive in the era of climate change that we really need stronger community relationships and deep relationships with our neighbors. So what I've been seeing, I came on as the executive director of community resilience organizations a little over two years ago. And what I see is still that the most important thing is these community relationships. But what I'm seeing more and more of now is the importance of localizing in a different way and for, some, for, for so many different reasons. And particularly looking at water, energy, and food. The WEF nexus, water, energy, and food. We need sovereignty in these areas. These are our basic human needs. These are the things that we cannot live without. We, need, we all need to drink water. We all need to, in the northern climate, stay warm. And older and younger people especially need to stay cooler. Um, and we need, to, we need to provide food locally and not be relying on food being shipped in from California and other places. We have the ability to grow it here. And um, healthy soils, having healthy soils is such a huge part of this, obviously. But, Providing our basic human needs. This is this is now what I'm seeing is really the most important thing. Um, and then, so we need sovereignty in those areas, but we need connectivity, connection to each other in the form of community co-creation. And that's the relationship piece. That is, you know, that's something that we just, that is what is going to carry us through, and that's how we need to be localizing by building these community relationships with each other, really with each other and our neighbors. Um, and that not only will help us provide our basic human needs um, and, and having some codependence on other people in our community, but we will become happier and healthier humans as a result of that and more connection. So I want to challenge you to think about resilience and that word in a much broader definition than you may have in the past when you're kind of just thinking about responding to some disaster, you know, bouncing back, resilience. I want you to think about it in terms of the past, present, and the future. And I want you to think about that, about resilience in terms of your individual role. So ask yourself the question, what do, what, what brings me joy? What are my strengths? What are my passions? What are my personal gifts that I enjoy sharing with others in the community? What brings you joy that you can share in your community and you can do in a way that helps your community provide their basic human needs and services? And how can you joyfully contribute in that way? How can you use your personal gifts and blossom um, and help your, in a way that, that benefits your community and helps expand. And so that can come in so many different forms. You don't have to be the person in your town who's leading every initiative and doing all of these big, really public things. Like, do you happen to make a killer lasagna? Because if you do, that could be really useful. And you can, you can make that killer lasagna out of all local ingredients or try to grow all of them yourself and make that and share that with your neighbors and have a little community event? Or are you really good at 
social media stuff? And could you maybe volunteer with a local nonprofit and offer to do some of that for them? What are the things that you're you're good at and they, that you like doing that you can share and how can you be present in your community? That is what I'm trying to do with community resilience organizations and this nonprofit is a way to kind of help with the cohesion around all of this and around this resilience building so you feel like you're part of a larger movement because you are and the contributions that everybody makes are just incredibly important. Um, and how are we doing in time? You're cruising. You're got two whole minutes. I'm talking really fast. Can I do a song now instead? <laughs> um, no, but the way that we operate as a nonprofit is in different communities all around the state. And there are um, 12 different communities now who are working with us, yeah, it's good, right? Yeah, we started out with like two, and now we just keep building. And actually one in Randolph um, has just started. It's Randolph, Braintree, and Brookfield. But the way that, the, that we operate as an organization and trying to help um, be a, you know, kind of a, like an incubator for this resilience work is that volunteers in communities all around the state, and also in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, um, they decide that they want to form a team, a community resilience team, and then they can choose how, what, whatever they want to focus on, whether that's emergency preparedness or whether that's um, all sorts of different really fun events like Potato Fest. Hartford is starting Potato Fest. Um, a ton of different things, and and um, then. The, the communities uh, also share information with each other, but it's just, our organization is something that helps with the cohesion of all of this. Uh, what else do I wanna say? What else do I wanna talk about? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think the main message that I want to get across is that it's really important to, talk, to think about resilience in a really personalized way and finding your own individual role within that and that there's support and a question that I want to put out there to you to think about throughout um, the series tonight is what will it take, what does it take, what can it take for individuals to get involved more and in some different ways that they haven't necessarily been involved uh, in their communities before and how can we turn all of this into a bigger movement, a wider movement, building a culture of resilience so it's not just an anomaly and something we do sometimes but that this is always in our mind. We live in the climate change era, we live in a really scary, difficult but beautiful and wonderful time also and, and you know, we are, we're all here to support you and our communities and we're, we're building this together. And so it's just what to consider. How can, how can we do more and how can we turn this into a more cohesive movement together? Dennis, and he's getting the technology ready. <laughs> Simon Dennis uh, is with the Center for Transformational Practice in White River Junction, and he's going to tell us a bit about the work that they're doing, and also his reflections on resilience and the social mycelium is what I like to think about with all of us working together and mimicking our great ones under the ground that are showing us how to do it right. Thanks, Kat, uh, and uh, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, I appreciate Kat and Chris for inviting me to participate in this way. 
Um, as Kat said, I come to you from the Center for Transformational Practice, where we advance inner transformation as the foundation for positive social change. And so we do this through offering programming, including workshops and uh, retreats, and also doing networking in the community, uh, in particular with directors of nonprofits. You all hear Simon? Does he need yes. a mic? No. No, he's good. Great. Uh, directors of nonprofits and clergy and some, and some activists. Uh, yeah, this is the backyard where I live. And um, the, so, so when I think of social mycelia, I wanted to approach this not from the standpoint of the um, apparent connections between people, the types of things we can graph on, on paper, our organizational affiliations and the connections between the different organizations, but rather what you might call the, uh, the subtle social mycelia. In other words, uh, mycelia being something that happens underground is the way that uh, one plant communicates with another in ways that we don't actually see. It's kind of the, the so for me, social mycelia triggers thoughts about collective consciousness. And so what I wanted to do is just say a few things about that. Uh, and, uh, and we can recognize collective consciousness um, Anytime we're within a group by the means of the way that the group field evolves over the course of the time that we're together. Uh, and every group that we enter into is, in, is the social field is evolving and changing over the course of our time together. Um, and it's quite flexible. We can adjust it with very minor things. For instance, I can adjust the social field in this room right now just simply by pointing out, friends, we are a group. Here together in this room, we are a group. And you notice that when I say that, there's a little bit of a shift that takes place in the energy of the room. So when you see that shift, you know, oh, there must be something there that's shifting because we noticed a difference. So we take a uh, social field quite seriously, and it has a lot of implications for how we can navigate as uh, organizers and how we can work in groups. With when you build the social field, you are in a position to uh, uh, exercise a greater kind of collective synergy in the group, uh, you bring out the collective genius in the group, you also can develop friendships more easily, it becomes a more hospitable environment, uh, and uh, ultimately you become more comfortable in your own body and enjoy your work together more. So the, uh, um, investing in the social field has a lot to offer us um, as organizers and activists building resilience in our community is a very important thing to focus on. But what I wanted to do is focus on an aspect of the social field which actually holds us back. And that is the way in which, in addition to um, kind of dict uh, the social field also dictates everything that can be said or thought within the context of a certain group. Uh, and we can notice that uh, quite a bit by means of the way in which what we can say shifts when we move from one group to another, or what we can think shifts move from one group to another. So I wanted to just do a, a little experiment here. I'm going to ask you a question. And um, my request is don't try to answer the question, but just observe how it feels in your body for me to pose this question to you. The very important question for our particular historical moment. The question is, are we in a emergency time? If you're like me, your response to hearing that question is, involves some, a little bit of tension. Because on the one hand, you say, yes, we're in an emergency time. But on the other hand, you say no, because a lot of your activities are sort of geared towards business as usual, and we're heading down this track, and we forget that. And not only that, you also have to navigate with the assumptions of the group that you're now part of. What are our collective assumptions about what, are, about what kind of time we're in right now? Uh, this particular um, uh, <coughs> Question is important because um, it has a, it lays the foundation for a, lo a lot of what we're going to do together. So, for instance, um, uh, similar uh, when Greta Thunberg says um, our house is on fire, that actually you can you can get a feeling of how something is being disrupted. That's a super powerful statement for her to make, and uh, and why? Because it disrupts our cl our collective assumptions about uh, what, we're, what we're up to at this time. So this is the, the flyer that was hung up yesterday on the, uh, over the bridge that passed uh, over 91 uh, by the 350 Next Step uh, uh, 
next step. Vermont. Oh, yeah. I can see that reduced credit. Credit for Mark there. That's indicating what an important um, I was, that, that little girl? That was Greta. Greta said that. And, and uh, yes, I was on the group that helped me hang these things. I enjoyed that. Uh, so okay, how do I know that we are we have a big part of our heart and mind that's dedicated to business as usual? As, may, as some of you know, I may be, I'm on the, um, the select board for the town of Hartford. If you ever want to join a group that has is experiencing a lot of inertia in terms of the evolution of its thinking, I recommend you join uh, the select board. The select board is deeply tapped into the uh, collective social field of thinking in the whole town, right? So it has to average that all out. Not, not a terribly progressive environment. And so we do things like we are, we are currently considering are we going to spend $3 million or $4 million building a pool. And sometimes I'm in this discussion, I'm thinking, is this what we should be doing in an emergency time? <laughs> or should we be investing in getting our roads ready for the kind of severe weather events that are going to be coming down the pike? Or, should, or are there other things we need to do to prepare for the future? So, I, you know, you can only spend so much political co uh, capital bringing these things up, but it's definitely <laughs> out of my mind. And we also have, it's nice to follow up on, on uh, Mindy, because we have a, a community resilience group in Hartford and um, that Kai is on, as one of the, one of the founding people. And um, we spend a lot of our time doing things like um, looking at fire preparedness, looking at the um, hazard mitigation plan, uh, collaborating around things that we would probably be doing regardless of whether or not we were in a state of emergency. And very rarely does the question come up, we're potentially facing human extinction. Or we are on the brink of massive societal collapse. What, do we, what does that say about resilience? Is that in our definition of resilience? And for the most part, it's pretty hard to bring that forward because the social field within which we're operating is the municipal social field, and it basically excludes that kind of consideration, that kind of dialogue. So, uh, so we talk about things like the pool, and, uh, and we enter into these. I, what I wanted to do is share with you a story um, actually, I got a couple of slides to advance through. There's a select board environment. <laughs> That's the kind of thing we talk about in the select board environment. And the last thing I want to do is I want to share with you a story uh, that may interest you um, that starts uh, about three years ago. We hired a town manager who happened to be come from a career in the Pentagon in the town of Hartford. And uh, f first of all, I should say he did an excellent job. We are extremely fond of this man and he did a, he did a fabulous job. Uh, there he is, standing, standing at the microphone. And after two and a half, after about a couple of years, he came to us and said, my health is not good enough to do this job. I have to step down. So we initiated the process of hiring a new town manager. And um, I developed kind of a working relationship with this fellow after I got to be chair. We had to meet every other week and figure out about the, about the um, agenda. And um, when we got to the very end of his time at Hartford, we had set the agenda, the two of us were sitting in his office across from his desk, and we had some time. And I said, Leo, I want to talk to you about some ideas that are on my mind, and I'm really, I want to just ground truth check them to see whether or not this makes sense to you. And he said, yeah, sure, let's, let's talk about it. Let me, what's, what, what's up? So I said, well, I'm, I'm thinking about severe weather events, and I'm thinking about this three and a half million dollars that the town of Norwich is now trying to spend on repairing their roads from the damage that was done on July 1st, 2017 and uh, the projections and how that's going to affect our budget. It's like, yeah, this is very serious. And so I'm thinking about uh, the way um, we're dropping bombs in seven other countries right now and the global movement away from using the uh, dollar, US dollar as the Federal Reserve currency uh, and, uh, and, um, and the effect that could have on the economy. I'm um, thinking about resource issues and kind of the way resources could evolve, you know, like some scarcity in that regard social unrest, we kind of talk about these different things. And I said, I just want to know, do you, do you feel like we should be talking about these things on the select board floor as part of our obligation to take care of our citizens? And, uh, and he's, after thinking over, he said, uh, yeah, I do. I actually I agree with you. It turns out he agreed with me not only in terms of the specifics that I was bringing up, he agreed with me in terms of the overarching conclusion, which is that our responsibility to the citizens of Hartford to take care of them includes being able to take include this notion of the potential for systemic collapse wow. as a reality that we're in right now. And here we were in the last three weeks of his career as, a, as the leader of town manager. And I'm thinking to myself, well, first of all, how come I never heard this from him? <laughs> Second of all, how come you never heard this from me? Right? <laughs> And, uh, and third of all, is there any way we can, we can use this convergence of point of view? Um, and, uh, 
And I said, would you be willing to help us in this regard? Could you say something to the select board, you know, to let them know your views on this? Because everyone respects you so much. And if you kind of, it would help us have this conversation, you know, who knows? It might save some lives down the road, right? If we could do this. And he said, actually, yeah, I'd be willing to do that. I'll, be, I'll bring it up with the select board if I get a chance. And as it unfolded, uh, it turned out that um, his health was not good. and He missed a couple of select board meetings at the very end, and it kind of just went by, and there was no opportunity for him to share that point of view with the select board. You know, it happened. Anyway, the point, the, the reason I want to share this story is not so much because of the outcome, but because of what it said to me about the pervasiveness of the social field within which we operate. Mm -hmm. That assumption about what the other folks are thinking, so the importance of building resilience and the importance of willingness to disrupt Willingness to spend that social capital in order to disrupt the assumptions of the group that you're in, bring forward the alternative counter narrative, uh, and uh, and what happens if you do, what happens if you don't, type of thing. Well, this is, here's the, uh, uh, an example of, of that. The other side of the bridge here, caution, climate crisis ahead. You can see the walkers going across the, the bridge. Thank you all. Uh, thank you guys. Perfect. Oh, hey. Perfect. Your internal timers on. Um, next, we have Henry Harris. Hi. <laughs> so, Kat brought up that she wrote to a bunch of folks and asked them to do some stuff. And uh, hell yeah, we did what she asked us to do. Kat Buxton is amazing. <laughs> my seven minute timer because Cat Buxton is a serious business. Oh, you got your own timer. <laughs> no, I want your timer too because right. you know, I need constant supervision if that's not immediately obvious. Uh, my name is Henry Harris and um, I work with Cat and Grace and Molly and some other folks here at uh, this brand new uh, gra Center for Grassroots Organizing in Marshville, Vermont. We just got a bunch of acres and we're crossing our fingers that it's going to have something to do with uh, nonviolent revolutionary organizing, centering uh, regenerative agriculture. What do you think about that? Yeah. 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 All right. <clears throat> so we think it's a great idea too. Right now it's just mud holes, you know, yeah. snow. And then uh, Karen and I and others also work as the Vermont Climate Union, trying to promote sort of a democratic united front around what the hell are we doing about this climate crisis, making sure that we're experimenting with democracy. I think right now there's this kind of moment that we're in where, uh, you know, what the hell do we do? There's this climate emergency, right? And when, when Simon just asked that question, are we in an emergency, and he asked me to feel what I felt like, I felt relieved. Because people should be asking that question way more often. I think we're in an emergency, and just to hear somebody talk about that makes me feel less alienated and less crazy. So we are in this emergency, and right now there's this thing where we're hoping that these like nonprofits and, and, and scientists and folks are going to have this moral argument and are going to just shame the legislatures and the capitalists and everybody into doing the right thing, even though they know and we know that that's not going to happen, right? So this, this slide that you can all see here, <laughs> these are chinchillas, right? Looks like a white face. I thought, see, I thought Simon was going to talk more about chinchillas. <laughs> Who's down with the chinchillas? Yeah. 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 Yes. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, this is a this slideshow is kind of long. It's kind of a, I was going to just run through two hours of uh, you tall people get out of here. We don't Sorry. care about this slideshow. <laughs> <laughs> Around you know, can I get some taller people to stand here? <laughs> um, anyway, so the idea is there have been these social movements. We know all about them, right? And they have been a product of really good organizing. Back in the 2000s, in the early 2000s, me and probably several of y'all were part of the global justice movement, the anti-neoliberal, anti-globalization movement. <laughs> And we were in the United States, we were mobilizers. And we'd just all show up at once, we'd make a bunch of noise. And we didn't really know a lot about organizing and really creating grassroots institutions and big uh, membership organizations. Um, 
So now I've got to mess with these slides, huh? This thing doesn't work. Okay, so um, what do I do with my cheat sheets? So um, there's, uh, these are these, these ideas that, great. These are these ideas that Mindy and I came up with about these basic tenets for the kind of movement that we need. Do folks feel like we need a movement? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, right? yeah, of course. Now, do we feel like we're scaled up enough and like our big enough movement yet? No, no, no. no. How about the degree of coordination between different geographic areas and different aspects of the movement? No, no. Well, no. Yeah. I like that. Who made the fart noise? <laughs> yes. yeah. That's how I feel about it, too. So, and I think that there are a bunch of tried and true methods um, to try to help us coordinate and create that movement. And instead of sitting around trying to, you know, make sure everybody read the latest cool book that makes us really sad or really inspired, we need to be employing these methods, right? The methods that are coming from the civil rights movement, right? Ella Baker, who none of us know enough about, but I do have this amazing 45 minute documentary that we should all screen, screen together this time. Um, was sort of the, the lead strategist for like 30 years of the civil rights movement before any of us ever heard of Martin. And she w fought really hard to make sure that all of these organizations all over the South and all over the Eastern Seaboard were uh, independent and were coordinated with each other and were talking about nonviolent revolutionary resistance and other things that they thought would be important. Let's see what else. So there was also the populist movement. Yep, the populist movement was amazing, right? The global justice movement in the early 2000s, we didn't know it was an agricultural movement. We thought it was about these sort of abstractions about world trade and you know sovereignty and you know Venezuelan oil companies can't push this around or something. But no, it was led by Via Campesina and agrarian interests from all over the world. And they were trying to stop the long-term plan coming out of World War II of complete agrarian dominance of especially the global south by the Monsantos of the world and, and crap like that. The populist movement started in a little county in North Texas in 1889. A couple redneck cotton farmers, basically sharecroppers, tenant lean farmers, got together and they started a little newspaper and in three years, by 1892, they had 40,000 trained lecturers presenting in tents across the entire country about fiat currency and the gold standard and, and, uh, and uh, basically teaching people to bulk their cotton and refuse to sell it to the market until the price went up. You know, big, big agricultural strikes. Now that was an amazing, that was an amazing economic vehicle for their movement. And in three years time, they had <coughs> millions of people, 1892, in wagon trains from Oregon to DC. That's who the populists were. They had a bunch of analysis that maybe we wouldn't be so down with today, but uh, they did put JP Morgan, the biggest mercantile <coughs> company in the world on his ear. It was amazing. What I think, incidentally, I've just been kind of, Everything I end up getting involved in always feels like something that I should have already been involved in for a long time. I like kind of panic. Um, I've been working with youth and stuff, trying to work with them because they want to keep it in the ground and whatever. Um, uh, this right here, this is a movement that's going on. A just transition is being promoted by the Indigenous Environmental Network, the Climate Justice Alliance, the Grassroots Global Justice. These alliances are the biggest frontline, people of color, indigenous-led alliances on the planet. <coughs> and, they, and we all hear all these other nonprofits talking about, let's follow the frontline leadership and let's be awesome to people of color and blah, blah, blah. Now come over here and donate to us and we'll pay these white people to sit at their computers and blah, blah, blah. Meanwhile, there, there, there are these amazing movements from all over the global south and they're talking about a just transition. Is that my seven minutes? <laughs> That's amazing. All right. Well, they're really nice talking to you. Okay, everybody, please just go like this. Okay, knock, knock. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thanks, Al. Oh, is that my timer going on? Uh -huh. Oh, is it sticking? <laughs> oh, it's in my pocket. <laughs> and our last speaker is Chris Wood. <laughs> and you're going to show us a little film clip. Yeah, with my seven minutes, um, change of pace from the other amazing presenters. 
Um, I'm going to show a clip from a film that we made. It's called uh, Dancing with the Cannibal Giant, New Stories for the Great Transition. And it's just a clip that uh, I, I love Simon's uh, presentation about, about the social mycelium. And the, and the big question that I always ask, um, Mindy talked a little bit about, okay, resilience, but how, do, how is it that we really get to change ourselves? A, a, both as an individually and when we are in a collective uh, space, you know, can, can we do it there as well? So this film, the intention was uh, just a couple of stories and I wanted the, the one that sort of, since this was the soil series, I chose the, the topic that really sort of connected with the soil and I have some discussion items for after we get going, but let me get it up and running, because I've only got seven minutes. <laughs> Start you in. It's an emergency. <laughs> oh, everything's working so far. So this is just uh, one of the stories um, from this film, this film that we show around the area, if anybody wants to see it. We show it to eight to 18 people is a good set to sit around in a room and have a conversation after. I started doing African drumming when I was six years old in the first grade, and my sister joined with me, and then I believe she did it for two years. Something like that. <laughs> and I've been doing it for five years. Our daughter Nishima is 13, our son Emmett is 11. They've spent most of their childhood on this land. Uh, before that, they spent the early part of their childhood living in urban south end of Albany. You know, it's, it's interesting because they're so immersed in the experience, their ability to reflect and see how it's different from other children is still limited. So my son will say, for example, oh, I don't really know anything about farming. And then I'll proceed to give a 45 minute tour to college students where he's explaining why you need all these varieties of heritage chickens and how you intercrop fava beans to capture nitrogen for your tomatoes who are heavy feeders. So they have a deep knowledge and a deep belonging. Nishimo is overhearing me talk about um, supporting a, a sister organization with their strategic plan. And she said, well, have you thought about encouraging them to use appreciative inquiry model? You know? <laughs> so I just think they're going to be very employable. Um, in fact, we've started hiring them. So Emmett does youth groups and Nishima is, does a lot of kitchen management and she also proofreads my grants for me. I mean, a lot of the people that come here are like really driven to change the world in what I think of as a better direction. People will come from like everywhere, all over the country, and just to see how much they value our work and how much they want to be a part of it. Soul Fire Farm, in some ways, you know, started as an idea when Jonah and I and our two infant age children uh, were living in the south end of Albany, New York, and Albany. Our neighborhood was termed a food desert by the USDA, meaning that even if you try really hard, it's almost impossible to get good food, to get fresh fruits and vegetables. So Joan and I both had a long history of, of farming other people's land and had a dream of having our own land. And when our neighbors found out that we had those skills, we were really encouraged to find that land, grow food, and to bring it back into the neighborhood. We purchased the land in December of 2006. And we've, when we arrived, these soils were as about degraded as they could be. And we've really spent the last five to six years building our soils, really seeing it as the source of the nutrition for our communities. Well, I think in regards to 
to the production of our farm, first of all, and, and why we are focusing on delivering food into food desert neighborhoods. We actually prefer the term food apartheid, which is really the food system that we have right now, where certain people live in food opulence and have access to their Whole Foods and their Trader Joe's. And there are also a large percentage of Americans, mostly black, Latino, and indigenous Americans, who don't even have enough to eat, never mind high quality food. And so the result of that is that even as our nation, rightly so, focuses attention on the rash of police killings against black and brown people and mass incarceration of black and brown bodies, we're actually five times more likely to die um, and be sick from diet-related illness than we are from all types of violence combined as black people. So our farm share accepts, on a sliding scale, uh, financial contribution for the foods. You don't need a car because that food's going right to your doorstep. Folks stay with us for many years. They come out to the farm, we go to their houses, we cook together. We run training programs at various levels for beginners up through advanced on how to farm and how to um, access land and credit so that we can become independent farmers. And we also work with a lot of black and brown youth. So when young people come, yes, they learn some farming skills and some cooking skills, but more important, it's about that reintroduction in a really whole and healthy way to the earth. So first of all, um, Thank you all so much for coming. I know you came a really, really far away and had to get up so early in the morning. And I don't know what Ms. Maxwell told you about this farm, but we're really dedicated to food justice and dedicated to ending racism in the food system. So like everything you do today goes toward that mission. Like we're going to be in a few minutes taking care of some soil and that soil will grow food for people who otherwise wouldn't be able to eat healthy food. I think a, a very large goal of this farm, Soul Fire Farm, is to spread the vision, the mission, um, to other people so that they can continue this work. People come from very far away to come to our programs, and although that's awesome, it also like really shows the need for this work in other places. I think for me, what roots me and keeps me hopeful in the face of the machine is, um, is a Jewish teaching out of Pirkei Avot that says you are not obligated to complete the task, but neither are you free to desist from it. If I consider myself obligated to end climate chaos and to figure out how to feed the entire world, then I'm not gonna be able to get out from under my covers. But I also can't desist from doing everything in my power toward those ends. And if I can inspire one person or 10 people or 100 people to do the same, that collective energy might be enough to shift the machine. And if it's not, and we lose, which is possible, I would rather go out knowing that I never gave up hope, that I always believed in a bright future. And in the process of, of building that bright future, I'm actually having a good life. And my children are having a really good life, and the people who come here are having a better life. And so the present moment is enriched by that work.
Can you hear me on the other side of the room? I hear you. Over there. <laughs> see, I love this part when everyone gets to see who else is here. It's great. So I'm, I'm going to ask that our four speakers get a, a moment to sort of summarize what they heard from each other and set the stage for this round. And what we like to do at this point is when we pass the mic, try and hold it, you know, notice that it's different here than here. Yeah. I don't really need a mic. If you're like me, don't worry about it. But if you're quiet, um, please do use it because we want to hear what you say. And we want to know who you are. We want to know where you're from. And, uh, you know, in Vermont or New Hampshire or around here, where you're living now. Um, and then uh, when we get to it, we'll also want to know, do you have any questions? Do you have any statements that you want to say? We're not going to do Q&A. Not only do we not really have time for that, but it's most important that in this next 45 minutes, we get to know each other because we are the ones we've been waiting for. <coughs> this is our community. And we are the ones that are going to build resilience upon the resilience that has been built before us. And we're going to continue to do that. We have to. Um, we don't really have a choice. And we're going to do that together. And we have incredible skills. And when we do these circles, I'm always impressed and inspired by who's here and the collective skills that we have. I feel less worried every time I meet more of you. Uh, the last, the last time I used the mic, nobody, it was all like people said, oh, it's garbled. They couldn't hear you. So I'll use my loud voice, which is much better anyway. Um, what I want to say about <clears throat> the film that we, the, the little segment that you just saw um, is is an important part of the work that that compels me personally. Uh, I'm, I'm the director of an organization that has a sort of a very wide focus uh, in, ter in terms of programming. Could you, would you? Oh, Beth. <laughs> <laughs> Understand um, Beth, Beth's need to, to, hear, to hear. You can do this. This works. Because the last time you said it was book garbled. It's always a little right bit further down. A little, little bit further down. There you are. Over the top. No, no, no it didn't work. Good. Okay. Just a little inch further away. Yeah. Really. Okay. Is this it? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, uh, I, Everything's coming back in, in, a, in the cycle here. Um, what I want to say is, very briefly, um, the, the focus of using this film is, is, for me, is part of the work that I want to be personally focused on, which is around the concepts of uh, um, Consciousness raising, culture shift, and um, and coming, uh, being able for in small groups to be able to identify together a collective both pain and trauma that we're all feeling, but to actually come in, come to that in the same space together um, as an opportunity to perhaps move us beyond the place where we are incapable of finding the capacity to change our routine in our daily lives. Because what happens is we're all conscious 
we say, oh gosh, climate change emergency, the emergency, absolutely the emergency. But how do you really, when you walk out the, the door after this meeting or after going to the climate march or whatever, how is it and what are the things that are going to actually move inside your body, inside your heart to make that shift? Uh, and I think actually it's been a great panel because I've been inspired by the different um, characteristics of each of each of the presentations um, and hopefully the the inspired words of Leah Peniman is is just another guy someone who's actually found and found a space and actually has sort of a conscious awareness of why she and clear clarity about what what she is doing and why she's doing it in the in the full context of acknowledging the emergency I used to ask my students and try to parse this out. What is it that makes some people feel a sense of responsibility for other people and for the world? And why is that absent in some people? What is that? And I think just by nature of who is here tonight, just by being here, I think you feel some sense of responsibility. And I think that there are there has been so much good work done and there are so many bright paths forward, though we are definitely in the midst of an emergency. And sometimes, you know, I appreciated that question too. And it's, yes, yes, we're definitely in an emergency. And sometimes we can let that, that reality go because we're also sitting here after having a delicious warm meal calmly in the presence of neighbors. It doesn't feel like an emergency in this present moment, yet we, we also know that it is. And so how can we use both of those feelings, the feeling of emergency and that calm, nourished feeling of and, and joining together to move forward and actually address this emergency together with cohesion? <coughs> Thanks. Um, I, I just want to say that I'm uh, really honored and flattered and all of that to get to be sitting up here with y'all and here with all of y'all in this. I love it when we come to Randolph and do the center of the state thing. You know, and say in Chittenden County and stuff. <laughs> Kat, what is it? So tell me the whole name of this series again. The Soil Series, Grassroots for the Climate Emergency. Right. Grassroots for the Climate Emergency. You named it. Yeah, that was your... <laughs> yeah, you did. Your I just want to... I didn't want to show up how to go right. I just want to show up. Anyway, um... The idea of the grassroots and the social mycelium and stuff that folks have been talking about and all of these connections and, uh, you know, Leah talking about the, uh, the diligence of of trying to get this work done together. It was so cool to see that, by the way, that this kid sitting over here by Karen. <laughs> Those kids are the first people that I saw influencing her to like talk about pop culture and like sing you know, Britney Spears or whatever. And it was really cool to see them up there educating college kids about uh, soil health. Um, and uh, I think that it's been really cool to see those folks who I used to know in a completely different context and they've got you know big social lives, but they've managed to discipline themselves and make a big offering to a larger <coughs> movement context. And I think that we're just all called on to do that. We've got this network, we've got these resources, and I think we've got this, whether it's an ethical or spiritual calling, to figure out how to share effectively, right? Um, you know, there's this, there's this lady, Grace Boggs, who's this kind of movement philosopher from Detroit, and she talks about this is the revolution, this is the first revolution in human history where we're gonna be fighting for our right to sacrifice instead of to gain, right? Getting off this global economy and probably joining each other in some kind of managed consensual poverty in hopes that our consumption doesn't tip us over, tip the tea card here. Um, so anyway, that you know, it was nice to only have to speak for seven minutes before because it could be kind of inferred that it was going to all come back together if I'd had a little bit more time. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
um, <laughs> but I think you know, what I was trying to what I was trying to get at is that there have been these agriculturally based movements in the past. I think that our main economy is the dairy economy in this state. People are getting milk checks with a uh, with a suicide prevention hotline brochure in them from St. Albans Dairy Co-op. And there's an opportunity for us, we're sitting here talking about soil health. All of us here, we're talking about, you know, intensive grazing, rotation, and blah, blah. It'd be a hell of a thing for a bunch of Northeast Kingdom farmers to make that kind of transition. But that would be justice if we supported them in making that transition. And with all the talk about water quality and the climate and the dairy collapse, I think we've got an opportunity, as, as grim as it is. And I hope that we can all work to, together to make that regenerative opportunity, not all these little nonprofits and little individual brave white people <coughs> thinking out loud about all what everybody should be doing, but us taking opportunities like what Kat has set up for us here tonight and Chris and the rest of y'all have set up for us here tonight to get together, talk together, and then work together. And I hope that we're all here for uh, when the rubber hits the road in a couple weeks for the, the next steps conversation. Thanks. Thanks, um, yeah, if there's something that uh, I, I would like to amplify um, something that was said by uh, Mindy mentioned earlier today about uh, the importance of n no one solution, but rather the solution is, is through doing what you love. And um, I think there's some real wisdom in that that uh, I always try and keep in mind because with urgency, sometimes we can have we can think, oh, we, then we have to twist ourselves into some kind of a pretzel, which is an unnatural state. Uh, but um, actually, the, our ability to impact society is a factor of depth. It's a factor of depth of dwelling within ourselves. It has it dictates the depth of our impact. Depth of dwelling dictates depth of impact. And uh, when are you dwelling more deeply than when you are doing what most calls to you, what you most love? So I think that there's uh, an aspect of uh, good news to that. The, the fierceness of the call is also good news insofar as it's an authorization to drop those things that are not most precious to you. Um, and similar to that is um, a, a fierceness of willingness to be in community with one another, which is part of what, just to um, mirror what Henry was just saying, Part of what's happening right here in this circle, there is a, a certain there is a form of warriorship associated with meeting people that you've never met before. It's a random group, and saying we're going to form community right now, and we're going to form it on the basis of the fact that I'm going to tell you what's actually in my heart, and I'm going to listen with an open heart to what what you have to share. Um, is a, a a huge piece of the solution as well, which is also good news. Insofar as that form of community is uh, so much of what we most uh, fervently uh, long for and desire. So, my name is Adam Yankowskis. This is my first time participating in this series. And I think it's been um, really great hearing all of you speak and you know, the video you presented as well, plus the follow up. Um, I feel that for me, when I you know, look at the theme of today and you know, resilience being uh, the core of it from at least my takeaway. Um, I'd say the biggest thing is to, to look inward in terms of, you know, the day-to-day -day interactions of um, what you typically consume. Uh, especially in the United States right now, we consume much, much higher rates overall uh, than most every other country. Uh, we have a lot of conveniences to us that are, you know, you can walk down the street you know, walk to the store in many communities here. You can drive to the local market. Um, I asked about I asked about uh, where a particular crop came from when I was at the market today, and it was you know shipped in fresh from California. And I you know thought about it's just like well I wanted the leak so I, that's what I ended up getting. Um, but recognizing that you know that came from very very far away, and looking at you know local consumption of um, you know crops that are seasonal. Um, is, a, is a big aspect of that and what's available and what can be you know, not processed, not shipped, and just grown you know, right at home or right at your neighbor's home and shared among the community. Excuse me, Adam, I couldn't hear what town you're from. 
Oh, I actually am um, an out of stater. So I'm up from uh, Massachusetts this evening. So I live in Gardner, Massachusetts. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Welcome you. Gardner. That's the chair city. Yes, yes. So uh, thank you all for um, this evening, and I look forward to hearing what everyone else has to say. Hi there, um, my name is Diorsha McDade. I live up in Worcester and um, I'm a carpenter and I also run an Airbnb out of my home, which is a little homestead. And um, yeah, I'm gardening and starting a little permaculture food forest and working towards getting my Airbnb more into a space where I could feed people to come and stay with me and have like a little micro farm and have an educational aspect to that. Um, like the Airbnb experience, people can come up from the city and just learn what it's like to you know, live in the country. You know. Yeah, this is Mike's not working. Mike's not working yet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm just not pointing it the right way. But um, yeah, really glad to be here and um, learning more. Thanks. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm Jesse Markson. I'm living in White River Junction right now. Uh, just extremely interested to continue to immerse myself in this community, starting a little farm. And I guess the question that I have is just more open-ended, but um, just how can I uh, listen more intentionally? How can I be a part of each and every one of all of your lives? Uh, more effectively and, and just be a part of this movement just like everyone else wants to be. Hi, I'm Grace. Um, is it, are you hearing me? We are. Yeah, yeah. just. I can just hear you, yes. Okay, well, <laughs> you can hear me anytime then. <laughs> but I, uh, I live in, the, in Barnet, which is in the Northeast Kingdom, um, and I have been involved with the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition since, you know, over a year. And, but my whole life has been devoted to um, advocating for organic agriculture, practicing as an organic vegetable producer for a while, and teaching about it and every other way that I could to promote uh, the, the general goals of this of this community, and I'm thrilled at, at the way people have been participating, and the, the number and quality of participation, and um, and I particularly made the effort to come today because of the quality of the presenters who I know, and. Uh, I think, you know, what, what really um, spurred me personally to reassess everything, uh, this has been a hell of a year for reassessing everything in my life, mm -hmm. um, but what really forced me to confront the, the climate emergency it was a health emergency, and uh, in January I was diagnosed with breast cancer, and have, was an early stage, and uh, the, with the help of an incredible supportive community, I'm doing great, and I'm going to end up in better shape than I was before. Um, but. You know the lessons learned and the the. the critical importance of the work we're doing has never, never been clearer to me. And I have so reaffirmed my personal commitment to doing everything in my power while I'm still able to, to work with you all and, uh, and make this happen. So thank you all for being here. Yeah. Hi. I'm Sylvia from South Stratford, and I care very much about the soil and um, try very hard to do the right thing. 
And I've never talked about this part of my life before, but I think now is the time. Um, I've been a vegetarian for 55 years, uh, beginning in high school. And it was not part of a group or a movement. I just kind of figured it out and began living this way. So I want to invite others to think about what relationship should we have with animals? Should we be killing and eating them? And what relationship do we want to have with the land? Is this an appropriate land use? And just check in with yourselves and see how you feel about these issues. And if you feel, as many people do, that meat is a, an important part of your diet, perhaps you can do it less. So, I, and I do mean invite. Just see where you are with, with those questions. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Stuart. I live in South Stratford, Sylvia. I'm a composer, which means I farm music paper. <laughs> <laughs> I think <clears throat> it would be probably a good idea for, for groups <clears throat> uh, that I heard the presentations of to check in with the Pentagon the CIA, the NSA, and the National Institute of Health. They all have gained it out. The CIA, I mean, the, the, the Pentagon, the generals, they're, they're highly educated folks. And they gained it out years ago, but the major problem uh, for the United States is monetary and weather. It's not like another country coming here. Um, and. The CIA analysts, <clears throat> it's the same. And the NSA sees it, because they're the ones that have, do the satellite spying. So <clears throat> it probably, I'm a Quaker and a pacifist, but I do know that those people are thinking deeply about the same things that everybody in this room is, and they have for a long time. Mm -hmm. So maybe it would be good to link up with some of those analysts in some way or other. Yeah. My name is Kai Cochran, and I live in West Hartford on a small farm. Uh, I've come to each one of these meetings and presentations, and it's been absolutely fascinating. Um, and I'm starting to get a feeling um, a kind of a feeling of coming together and being somewhat of one mind as these have, have, have come on. So I'm very glad that we're going to have this meeting on May 8th because what I really like is action. <laughs> I, I, I'm an action person. And um, I, I, I really want to get together with people and see if we can't figure out things to do um, that each of us can do and that we can do together. And, and I also, in my life I've been involved with many organizations mostly promoting uh, things that I thought should happen, like solar energy and wind energy and all those sorts of things in Montana. And then this kind of thing back here. Um, and I found that, that there are ways that you can spread the word in, in uh, a way that is not difficult for people to swallow. 
Um, humor is good. Yeah. Humor is really important. And also, uh, as, as we've thought of in our, our uh, community resilience group, we've decided that, that um, humans' tendency to, to uh, sort of want to vie against each other on things, uh, sort of contests like, like uh, you know, every, there are so many sports that people just love, you know, and people, and, uh, that we decided that what we're, we're doing this summer in Hartford is because we have five villages and we've always felt that we were kind of a scattered town because it was five villages and not a nice main street sort of thing. Um, we thought that that was going to be difficult for us, but we decided that what we want to do is take those five villages and have them vie against each other. Another one of the things that we feel, we feel strongly about is that more people should be growing their own food. Yeah. And so we're having this contest that we're calling Potato Fest, where we are having the five villages vie against each other to get each one to get as many of the residents of that village growing some potatoes as possible. Um, and then we're going to have a great big celebration in September where we're going to have all things potato, including a, a potluck and songs and games and poems and all sorts of uh, probably skits and everything else. Um, and, and we're hoping that not only will that uh, sort of tap people's uh, um, feelings that they like, like to uh, have a contest, but also bring them together. As, as villages come together, and then as we all come together at the end, um, hoping that it'll be a good time, a fun time, but that also we're going to learn a lot and, and become a, a, another little step towards resilience. My name is Keith Walsh. I'm from Thetford Center. Uh, yet again. I'm incredibly encouraged by the connectivity that happens within this space. Uh, and I'm encouraged at the future uh, that that will bring out. Uh, one thing that I've been thinking about recently in terms of my social mycelial networks uh, is the fact that, uh, and this is off on kind of a separate idea, one in two, maybe one in three, I can't remember the exact statistic, of Americans are on some kind of pharmaceutical medication. Mm -hmm and which leads to a lot of addiction issues. Yeah. And what they're seem to be finding now is that the root of addiction is a lack of connection. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so we, by building this connection, by our actions, by building further connection with our communities, with individuals, we under the surface are helping to build this connection to one another in a healthy way and resolving some of the deeper issues, not just in the soil, but within our social fabric as well. So know that although your intentions may be focused in one, specific, one particular field or aspect of this knowledge, uh, the, the, the ramifications, the ripples that come out from your actions through this mycelial connection, uh, I think are gonna heal a lot more of the wounds than maybe even just the physical ones that we see. I'm Susan Mills. I live in Randolph Center. I, in Randolph Center? Yeah. yeah. You're, you're close. <laughs> okay. Look right at it. I've, I've been living here in this, yeah, in Randolph Center since 81. Done a lot of different kinds of projects and community activism. Um, <coughs> And it, it's just great to, to see this continuing in this in this form too. I'm I am concerned about the, some of the people who were not here. Um, inclusion is really really important to me, um, and some of the people who just don't even think this is a problem. Um, and 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 particularly young people, and it's great to see. Um, that we have at least one representative, but I would like to to see more involvement with the schools 
I, I think that's, I just recently saw Greta Thunberg, her, um, her TED talk, this was about a week ago. I, I've heard about her, but I hadn't actually seen her. And to see her, man, she is something. Um, so there's a lot of potential there, I think. And if, if we can think of how to, to include more young people, I think that would be great. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Carl Tiedemann. I'm co-founder of Soil for Climate, a nonprofit based in Vermont. And we're honored to be one of the sponsors of the Soil Series. Um, for anyone interested in following this discussion at a global scale, and if you're on Facebook, our Facebook group has almost 11,000 members in more than 100 countries, so it's a great way to keep in touch with all of the latest research, videos, articles, and so forth. Um, I was fortunate over the last couple of weeks to attend two soil events, uh, the Living Soil Symposium in Montreal, um, and also uh, the GrassFit Exchange Conference in uh, Santa Rosa, California. And I can report that in, at both of those sites, there were hundreds, three to 400 people, I would say, at each event, who are all very much have at the forefront of their mind soil restoration and healing land. And in particular, at the event in California, um, the room was about half filled with uh, people wearing cowboy hats. And I'm sure many of them are at different ends of the political spectrum than I am. And I was heartened to realize once again that this is an issue that crosses all political lines. Um, and very conservative people also want to, literally the, the definition of conservation, you know, to, to heal the land and preserve a future for their children and grandchildren, and I take heart with that. I'm Mari, and together with my wife, Laura, we founded Green Mountain Girls Farm in Northfield 10 years ago. Um, you know, we uh, tried to make a nod to the revolutionary Green Mountain Boys with our name. Um, and, you know, the successes include some documentation of carbon and air very deep in our soil. Um, and in uh, a short amount of time, we've made some changes. Uh, I can also report that we have a family that for 10 years has bought food just about every week from our farm and they used to shop at Shaw's. So it's a really big step when a family gets 70 to 80% of their calories um, from within a half a mile of their house. I can tell you they were our first customers and when they joined, we thought our future was bright. And um, the 10 years since haven't been that bright. <laughs> Not that many people <coughs> step forward and vote towards the things we we're talking about, caring about with each meal and each bite. And um, so, you know, I guess um, when I look at Vermont moving forward, I think that uh, a tourism that's, face, that's based on regenerative agriculture and a geotourism that really takes advantage of this syndemic with obesity, chronic disease, undernourishment, and climate change all spoken about together, um, that we can reach out to people who do care about wellness. Um, and as for us, we host agritourists, um, and we, we hope um, that together with our neighbors, these people that care about um, not only food as medicine, but as farms as medicine, um, you know, come up to Vermont, forest bathe, come out to the farms and farm soak. Welcome to our place, come anytime. Hi, I'm uh, Lynn Wild from Montpelier, and um, I, I really want to say thank you for talking about this being a crisis of, and an emergency. And I have to agree that when I heard you ask that question and, and, and call it what it is, the sense of relief was immense. I've been recognizing this sort of by myself and pushing it out to other people uh, since 1972 and trying to find uh, people who could talk about it and work towards preventing it. So I'm really grateful to be here. This is my second time and um, I feel like I'm uh, at a 12-step meeting. <laughs> yes, I, I'm, a, I'm a consumer. <laughs> but, um, so, so I'm also on the Montpelier Tree Board, and we're getting ready to plant 200 trees in May. 
and um, we're planting them in neighborhoods and trying to get neighbors to come together and work with us to put trees on their property and explain the relationship of trees as part of our life support system with rain and with um, dirt soil. And I'm really pleased to tell you that in Montpelier, May is, becomes Tree City. It goes from being Poem City in April to being Tree City. And to call people's attention to trees uh, and help them understand that they, there is a sentience among trees that needs to be recognized. And so one of my questions is, um, as Gabe Brown talks about in Dirt to Soil, putting a massive diversity of cover crops on the land, what can we put at the base of trees uh, to create tree guilds to help support the mycelial growth at the base of trees and that connectivity, but in an urban setting, not necessarily in a forest? Because our trees are really, really struggling in town to survive the assault from salt and snow plows and lawnmowers and you know. But what can we put at the base of trees so we don't need to put lawnmowers right up to trees or weed eaters or let's quit weed eating or, or let's eat weeds differently. Uh, so anyway, that's my thing and I'm really grateful to be here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rick Gottesman. I live in East Bethel in a, uh, a tiny house that I built myself. <clears throat> I'm currently living on a 40-acre parcel of land, and the two landowners and another person and, and I are in the very early stages of forming a uh, cooperative community, which is based on low income, um, low consumption, and uh, mutual aid. Um, so I really appreciate all the proactive, positive things that are happening here, I, but I just wanted to bring people's attention to one other thing, and that is the, um, the idea of resistance or <laughs> civil disobedience. Does, everybody, does, anybody know, does anybody not know what, who Extinction Rebellion are, the, the, the group? Does anybody know who they are? Extinction Rebellion? I've heard of them. Yeah. yeah. I don't know too Extinction much Rebellion them. is a, uh, a movement started in the UK, <clears throat> and uh, they're calling, <clears throat> they do civil disobedience and whatnot, they're calling for, uh, it's coming across the pond to this side of the, of the uh, Atlantic now, so it's just starting here in this country. And they're calling for a week of action uh, worldwide, and so far there are 120 some odd um, cities around the world that are uh, taking, it's, it's a worldwide uh, movement, and the idea is for um, civil disobedience, and however, whatever form that takes for you, you can, you know, the, the whole gamut of civil disobedience. Uh, the idea being that not only do we have to have these new <clears throat> ways forward in, in this emergency, but we also have to slow down the destruction that's happening at the same time. So it's not an either or thing, it's a both and, okay? The, uh, call, the worldwide call starts this the 15th, which is Monday, and it runs through the 22nd. So you can look up to see if there's any um, actions in your area. I don't know what's happening in Montpelier. I'm going to Boston that week because I have friends there. Um, I know there's things happening there. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. We have lost 50% uh, of all of the uh, species on, uh, number counting species on Earth in the last 40 years or so. Uh, just to put that extinction thing in, uh, <laughs> in context. Um, I'm Henry Swayze from Tunbridge and a member of the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition. And this, unfortunately, is my first one of these I've been to because I've been out of state and have not been here to do them. Um, <coughs> For 15 or 20 years, uh, back in the uh, 70s and 80s, I taught people how to do sustainable farming with livestock. And a lot of that was to make profitability better. And 
I have, uh, I, I took a break in that business. Uh, my wife had Alzheimer's for 14 years and it slowed down what I was doing. Uh, and I've kind of gotten back in gear now. And um, I knew that we were sequestering carbon when, uh, when we were teaching that and we tried to tell people that that was happening. But the world really wasn't very interested in that, so it wasn't a big point. Um, uh, I now have learned from Walter Yena that, uh, that we're actually cooling the planet when we uh, uh, cover things up with green plants mm -hmm. and, uh, and keep those plants growing all the time, um, which is what grazing management actually does. <laughs> um, and, and that's really my focus, and I'll be presenting on that in a couple of uh, weeks when we get to that. Um, in terms, of, in terms of, of what I reach out to this group and to other people and to myself to try and understand, I do think we're in an emergency. I think we're moving like molasses in January in terms of, of, uh, of making, of, of combating that emergency. Um, I do think that uh, movements can grow exponentially so that uh, a lot can happen in a very short time when people wake up to the fact that, that things have to happen. Um, and I, I think quality of life comes from community and community relationships. Uh, I think if you are a rich person living in a gated community and have two people you have dinner with once a month and that's your life and it's all about uh, spending and managing your money, uh, I think it's a pretty miserable kind of life you're existing. And, and so how to build that, that local community, uh, how to, uh, how to I, I participate in my community a lot, but I don't feel as though it's, it's changing from um, uh, the, the or, people aren't getting out and doing so much together as they did before we had media, before we had um, 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 jobs, <laughs> you know, that, that were little narrow smokestack jobs. Anyway, so, uh, so how to get, how to, to turn on that community, uh, and I've heard the potato uh, <laughs> uh, and trees, and, and, and I think that that, uh, I think doing things that you have a passion for is the way to, to, to energize that. But I'm, I think discussing that more, figuring out how to do it better, getting more skillful at it, it would be very important in this whole project. I'm going to hand this back to you, if I may, because I talk with my body. <laughs> I, I do. Um, I came to the first meeting last time it was here, a couple weeks ago, whatever. I was very impressed with the turnout and the in-depth scientific knowledge presented by the speakers. And I have a background in science and I understood 2% of it. <laughs> the part I got was in the tablespoon of topsoil are billions of creatures and if you line them up back to back it would be a mile or two long. I apologize for breaking the topsoil from the John Deere plow who, came, who invented it here and brought it to Illinois for manufacture. But I didn't apologize for running the honey wagon where we put the manure 
back on the fields. Um, I'm part of the Randolph Region Re-Energized Program, and we're having a wrap-up of the first phase on April 24th. And Susan Mills told me, oh my, it's the same night as the next soil series. So John Coppins called up and he said, we'll work it out. We're kind of overlapping. And we were working on how many people we were going to have at our meeting next on the 24th with John Copans, and uh, I'm going to put in 25 names for the meal from this group until somebody calls me up and say, no, put in 50 names. <laughs> um, Mark Kelly and Susan and I were working with John Copans this morning um, on what our priorities were going to be for the next couple of years, and I'm inviting all of you, every one of you, to come to that meeting on April 24th to say we have to add soil to our priorities. Thank you. Gary Durr. So is that meeting before or after ours or what? They're trying to line it up so that they end at 7. So that so the people could starting at 7 come to here. It hasn't been worked out. And I should say, this is primarily for people in the Randolph area. So. Well, good evening. Uh, I'm David. Uh, I'm here in Randolph. And my word tonight, uh, as several have already expressed, uh, my, my word is, is connections. I uh, really like the uh, potato challenge in, in Hartford. <laughs> Uh, I really like what uh, the challenge that, that uh, Gary kind of just described in terms of how we're going to work out the uh, uh, two meetings occurring on the, on the same night in a couple of weeks uh, so that we all have the opportunity to attend both. Uh, and I, I get a little different take on the uh, swimming pool issue down in, down in Hartford. Uh, I think that swimming pool is, is, is really important. Uh, Randolph has, has dealt with a swimming pool issue over the last couple of years. Uh, and as one who lives uh, just a block or two from, from the town park, and, and, and I'm through there uh, several times a day, uh, pretty much every day during the summer, and just see the 100 to 200 kids that, that are at that pool uh, from all parts of the community, uh, that, that, that's all about connections. And it's those opportunities, and, and again, the potato challenge and what Gary is talking about, that uh, really moves us from we and them uh, to, to us. Uh, and that, that's really our only, not only our best way forward, it, it, it's, our own, it's our only way forward. I had a uh, very bewildering experience uh, this, this past weekend. This will sound common to anybody who uh, leaves the state for a couple of days. Uh, we did. Um, uh, my wife and I traveled down to Annapolis, Maryland, uh, specifically to attend a um, uh, extraordinary uh, music event that, that was highlighted by an original composition uh, written by uh, Kathy Eddy of, of Randolph. And, and uh, uh, it, it drew us that far afield to, to, to attend. And uh, we were only out of, you know, of course, you only get out of Vermont in about 24 hours, and, and you do start feeling bewildered. <laughs> uh, as, as we did when, when it, geez, I mean, we got down to this, you know, supposedly uh, you know, quaint historic uh, American city, Annapolis, uh, and, and, and and we're just getting, you know, it, it's, it's just a buzz of, of six-lane traffic. I, I don't care where you're going, uh, what time of day you're trying to do it. Uh, uh, just a tsunami of, of individuals in these four-wheel pods that they're crunching into each other and trying to avoid each other. Uh, and it was bewildering in that I was wondering, where, where's, where's the community? Um, uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm dizzy in here, in this place. Uh, but the, the, the concert was, uh, was spectacular. Uh, and, and, and I think the, the, the word concert itself talks, of, talks about unity. And, and this brought together uh, 
and these are all volunteers, a 100-member orchestra, well, no, a full orchestra, I'm not sure the count, but I know it was at least a 100-member choral group uh, performing uh, these compositions uh, Saturday night. Uh, and and, and it, it truly, truly was extraordinary. And, and so even within the uh, labyrinth and bewilderment of, of what seemed to be the external part of Annapolis, of Annapolis I realized that, that there, are, there are community connections. Uh, and following the concert, you know, there quite a few people from Randolph went. Uh, and following the concert, a former resident of Randolph came up and, and spoke to me. Um, and, and he had left Randolph five years ago and, and, and lives in Baltimore now. Uh, and he said, geez, you know, from what I follow, um, uh, there's a whole new generation of, of leaders, new leadership coming up in Randolph. And, and I said, yeah, you know, that, that, you know that, that's really true. Um, and just the uh, last example I, I guess I'll give is uh, uh, part of that new leadership uh, is someone that over the years, I've always been on the other side of the political issues. Um, if he's on one side, I'm always on the other side. Um, and at town meeting, uh, we had the opportunity to speak. Uh, he has really brought uh, energy and an impetus to uh, returning a uh, rope ski to, to to Randolph, uh, the, the winter equivalent of, of the summer swimming pool. And, and uh, as we spoke at town meeting, I said, you know, this is something you know, I really would like to work with you on. And that, you know, it's probably the first time we've ever had that conversation. Um, uh, and so as a civilization, I think we can model that right now and, and uh, realize in and, and, and a special culture of our small communities have such a great opportunity not to live as uh, kind of we and them, but as, as us. And, and, and the woman uh, from Soul Fire Farm said, you know, she said it, and I'm going to say it. I don't know if we're going to be successful. Uh, you know, long term, nobody does. That's the tension we live in. Uh, but we can start living that higher expression of, of civilization, like right now, right uh, together. Uh, and and uh, with, with Potato Challenge, and, <laughs> Uh, the, the things we're hearing about tonight, uh, and even with um, swimming pools and ski toes, they, they bring us together. I just want to remind folks of the time. Uh, it is 8.35. I think we should keep going, but I just want to let you know what time. Uh, <coughs> I'm Joel Parmley. Uh, I have a small beef farm up in Randolph Center. I was also a plumbing and heating contractor in town just retired recently and uh, I don't have much for comments tonight it's past my bedtime <laughs> so do you have a do you sell product off your farm yes I'd love to be able to send that out to people uh, do, you, do you have a, a farm name Parmalee Parmalee Farm Parmalee. Okay. My name's Nancy. Um, I'm from down south. I live outside of Bellows Falls. Um, and I've been trying to connect up a bunch of different thoughts that are tumbling around in my head since I started coming to these um, workshops. Um, and also, I was at the NOFA conference this winter and um, heard Leah um, Penman. So thank you very much for the, the clip of the work that she's doing at Soul Fire Farm. Um, she's really inspirational, and I was taking what she said about um, her children and raising them in that environment, and um, I was busy this week um, creating potting soil from the wonderful resources on my farm and tending my seedlings, and when I'm not doing that, I work with teachers of young children. and. Um, Growing seedlings is a lot like working with <coughs> infants and toddlers and preschoolers. And I was listening to several people um, around the room talk about the importance of um, young children and families. And um, that's kind of what I'm about. And I've been thinking about ways that I can do things in the very small neighborhood that I live in outside of Bellows Falls. We're a very tight-knit 
um, neighborhood, and there are two other people in my neighborhood who um, do some small-scale farming and sell um, products from their land. And it just occurred to me, sitting here, they're both ex-kindergarten teachers. And someone started off the conversation about how do we take responsibility. And when you're a teacher or a parent, you are forced to take responsibility. And there are so many connections between parenting and teaching and being a farmer. And I live them out in my life very consciously, but I think it's, it's probably true for all of us. And so lots of what I do, someone else said something about you have to do what you're passionate about. And I get to do both of the things that I'm passionate about together. Um, one of the things I do is I have a very tiny CSA with family child care providers. And um, so I bring them food for 13 weeks over the summer and I see their children, and I see the changes in what the children eat over that 13 weeks, and I see the impact of them suddenly eating beets and cabbage and kale and how that impacts their parents. And so there's lots of really tiny things that we can do individually that have ripple effects, like you were talking about with your family that's not eating at Shaw's anymore. Um, so. You know, we're in a crisis, but we're also in an ongoing process, uh, I think, of supporting people to live through that crisis. So that's my hope. What's the name of your farm? Bloodroot. Bloodroot Farm? Mm -hmm. um, hi, I'm Louise Peary. Hold it up. I can't hear you. Um, Louise Peary. Um, uh, that's my dad right there. Uh, I recently moved I, to actually, if you hold it, a really farm fun. in really, yeah. Marshfield, Good. Um, and hopefully that will turn into something. Um, I was intrigued about your comment about the pool being the only way to move forward. Um, I think three to four million dollars could be put towards a lot of things. Um, that could possibly be more fruitful to a community. Um, I'm really uh, thankful to be here and hear all of your stories um, and hopes for the future. Um, hopefully I can come to another one of these. Yeah, thank you. I'm Karen Bixler, I live in East Bethel. Uh, I'm a retired farmer and cheese maker. And when I quit raising animals because I didn't have enough energy left anymore to deal with that, I did have some extra energy, so I put it all into flower gardens. And then a couple of years ago, I was out in my flower gardens, and I had this aha thing of being at war with weeds. And I thought, that's not what I want to do on the land. I do, do not want to feel like I'm at war in, on my land. And so I've been looking for ways since then to shift that narrative. And this series has been just phenomenal for me. I've got all kinds of new ideas. Mm -hmm. I'm Tim O'Dell. I live in Corinth. And I'd like to uh, uh, especially thank Chris Wood for showing the, uh, the bit on uh, Soul Fire Farm um, because it's a very concrete example of what food sovereignty might look like, um, at least one manifestation of it. Uh, I would be interested to know uh, how it, man it emerged from its social field um, and uh, what its organizational beginnings were and uh, and uh, did that necessarily start with a, a business plan or did it grow more organically? Hi, I'm Tim McCosker and I live in Thetford and I uh, work with community groups to um, set up and run zero waste uh, community events. Mm -hmm. oh, cool. 
Uh, my name is Aaron Tittles. I live here in Randolph. I'm currently a software engineer, avid organic farmer, and compost enthusiast. Um, I just came out to see what the series was all about, and I'm flattened that I've come out and I'm starting to feel a better sense of community about other people that care about the health of the planet and you know what we can do to make progress and to healing everything that ails our current existence. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Hi, um, I'm Lauren. I live in Jericho right now, but I'm uh, very excited to announce that because of, in part, this program, um, I just quit my job and I'm moving up to Montgomery to live on an organic farm in a yurt for six months. Yeah. <laughs> Super pumped. Yeah. That's further away. Yeah. Well, why we need better transportation, public transportation in Vermont. Um, but one thing that kind of has been resonating with me today um, is this idea of community and how I feel like there's this inherent, like, spatial component of community, but at least for myself and maybe for like my own generation, I don't feel tied to a place. Um, I've moved seven times since I graduated from college four years ago. And so I think community and what community looks like is shifting. Um, and I think a lot of what my community is is online in an unfortunate way. Um, but it's also like who I see on a regular basis that doesn't live next to me, but maybe lives 45 minutes or 12 hours away. But those are the people that I keep in contact with. And so try and figure out how that community can be strengthened through a physical process of regenerating soil is very interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good luck. I'm Cap Taylor, I live in Williamstown, um, and I just want to say that this series has really kind of rocked my world. Um, I always understood the idea of feeding the soil, but I always kind of thought of the soil as an inert thing, um, and I thought about life in the soil as pretty much being earthworms, essentially, and now I understand that there's this incredible, diverse, dynamic, symbiotic culture of all sorts of bugs in the soil. And so now, when I think about feeding the soil, I think about feeding those bugs, and how that really is going to really affect um, productivity and the health of the soil. And now I'm finding out that this, you know, having healthy soil could really be the answer to a whole lot of big problems. And I'm really excited about that. And so. I've been thinking about, well, so what do I do now that I have all this information? And so I've decided, well, I'm just going to start talking about it. So for instance, I was talking about it at work today, and um, one of my coworkers was mentioning having a meal with Wendell Berry. And he was talking about the big picture and what we can all do. And he said, if everybody took care of their backyards, yeah. then we could really have an impact. And so that is. That's a huge goal of mine as well. And I'm really grateful for the insights that this uh, series has brought me. Hi. I'm Beth Champagne. I once lived in Randolph. That was ending about 20 years ago, and I've been living up in the Northeast Kingdom since then. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, my community extends from here to there. Yeah. Um, that said, I just want to get to one thing that came up really early in this round, the circle. Um, and it's, it's got to do with, with seeing with different eyes. Um, when Jack Laser hosted a whole bunch of us for some gathering of which I've forgotten the name about a year ago. Um, I heard Peter Donovan speak. Now I had heard about Peter Donovan and his 
school bus that he lives in traveling back and forth across the country to visit about 300 farms that are trying to build the carbon organic matter <coughs> level in their soil. I had heard that he had a wood stove in his old school bus and a piano. <laughs> okay, but I have not anytime, anywhere in years and years heard someone who spoke with such depth, with such presence. Oh my gosh. So that's just to say that this is what his kind of key message was, and I'm not going to succeed in quoting it precisely, but it's if you want to make small changes, do things differently. If you want to make big changes, you need to see things differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for me, and this is still just starting, for me, it's to have a practice of pausing. When I'm having my first drink of water or bite of breakfast and allow myself to be aware that I have a lot to give thanks for, to have gratitude. I mean, a long time ago I understood that if I'm not happy, clean the lenses. <laughs> there's nothing wrong out there, but there's something wrong with the reception. So that, that pause to take in the wonder of all that makes my life possible and keeping going on, that's, that's a good place for me to start from, to pull together a community. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, three cheers for uh, gratitude. <laughs> I come from just over the hill there in Albuquerque, New Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I did live here um, up until a couple years ago for about 10 years. What's your name? My name is Pan Vera, like the goat-footed god from Greece, Pan, mm -hmm. not frying pan. <laughs> I am aware that we're now worldwide experiencing a crisis of loneliness because we're really not connected with each other very much in the ways that we used to be, where we grew up knowing people for our whole life. So I'm really excited to see how the combination of response to crisis climate is community. I'm very touched by Joanna Macy's advice a number of years ago when she said, okay, we've gone over the 350 point. It's not looking good. So just get into community. I can't over-recommend that. And I'm also uh, an avid gardener since I met Gene Kahn, who started this little company called uh, Cascadian Farms. Uh, he thought maybe organic farming would become important. And so my job was to haul chicken manure onto his fields. And uh, I'm very proud of him and very proud of the organic movement. And I'm also an avid gardener. <coughs> And um, I have uh, a, a new home that has quite a large space, and I'm going to be turning it into a community garden. Uh, one of the things Gene Kahn said was he was tired of growing garden greens. Everyone should just grow them in their closet. <laughs> and we can do that. <laughs> we can do that. Now let me introduce to you a real farmer. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> <I>, uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm Mark Kelly, and I'm from the Far East. I, I live in East Randall. Um, and uh, where, yes, we do have an organic farm. Um, I'm, I'm very clear on the fact that, that community building is the, is the key to resilience. And I'm clear on the fact that we definitely need to build resilience. And I'm clear on the fact that that soil building is one of the keys to the, the environmental crisis. Um, however, I, I, like many people, I think, um, I would like to get clarity about the nature of the crisis. And the gentleman from South Stratford mentioned the, the military, the CIA. 
Every five years, the CIA does a, a uh, scenario planning exercise where they look at what they just imagine what might happen in the next few years and try to think, well, what should our response be to that idea? Um, and the European Union has done the same thing. Uh, I have to admit that the European Union's uh, scenarios are, are a lot more uh, pleasant to uh, uh, think about than the CIA's, but they both have a lot in common. Because starting from now, there are, are uh, any number of ideas that may play out into the future, and and we can think about them and start to think, well, what's the most important thing for us to do right now um, in the face of all these potential futures? So my, my feeling is I'd love to have a, a group like this um, do that kind of scenario thinking and planning and, and try, to, try to figure out, okay, well, where should we be putting our, our best efforts? Um, and so, that's, that's my idea for now. Yeah. Here I am, the, the last of the group. Um, I'm, I'm Josie Carruthers. I wasn't going to forget. Our farm name? Farm name. Rising Mist Farm in, in East Randolph. Um, and um, so East Randolph. East Randolph is, um, is like an underdog village of the area, um, and um, we have a, a goodly portion of poverty and probably a touch of depravity and a lot of beauty. And um, we, uh, some of us decided a couple of years ago that we were, we are on the um, middle branch of the White River. And um, we decided that we would form a community group that we call the East Valley Community Group it being the Far East, as Mark said. And, um, uh, and so what we're up to, and there was a guy named John Pimental who was here earlier, who's uh, working with us deeply on this, um, is that we're building resilience by building a community group. Um, we are promoting neighbor versus meeting neighbor, um, and um, we're sponsoring social events, and we're working to get our um, historic old beat up community hall reopened. It's been shuttered by the town, uh, reopened and renovated so that we can uh, do something that uh, people, some people are calling the social infrastructure um, in order to promote democracy uh, and um, work against inequality, work against the, the, uh, the paranoia, the silos, the, the, the gated mentality. Um, we need to promote something that some people call positive proximity. The being around people is a great thing instead of, I don't want to do that. For example, tonight, of course, is a prime example. This whole fantastic series has been an example of that. Um, and so um, and this is, so the, the social infrastructure actually means that you have physical places to go. A good example, although not always acceptable, is a bar. <laughs> um, uh, you get a drink and you're a participant, you're in the club. Um, and we need to have that feeling of belonging for people, that there's a place where people can go, where you, you yourself can go, and feel that you are actually physically welcome there. Um, and, uh, and so uh, that's, that's our contribution to resilience. Um, and um, uh, and that we, we, have, we have a lot of potential, a lot of hope. And um, I guess that's it. My, my final comment is I'm eagerly looking forward to this, uh, the seventh session number on seven. Number, number seven, seven. on yeah, mystical. Seven on May 8th, um, because uh, as this woman in the pink shirt said, I too am an action person. And I, I would feel grief at the end of this series and to walk away when we hadn't knit something. So thank you. It was actually, it was actually your comments that made the seventh um, program happen. That's true. Um, so, Thank you all so much for yet another 
really great soil series night. Um, I always learn more than I think I'm going to learn, uh, and different things than I thought I was going to learn. And I meet new people, and I'm so grateful for that. So thank you so much. Um, I, I do want I do have a comment though about resilience that I just want to share with you. Um, I am very interested in promoting the understanding of the soil health principles. Um, I have them up on the wall, but they're really small. And I'm just going to re read them to you. They're in all of our notes. Um, these principles are, I think, the best thing we can do in our yards, on our porches, on our farms, in our communities. Living roots in the ground. No bare soil. Maximize diversity. Minimize disturbance and animals in contact with soil. When people say to me, well, what can I do in my yard to do this? And I'll often say, well, where, where do you sit on these soil health principles right now? And is what you are thinking about doing moving you one tiny bit toward meeting those principles? And if the answer is yes, I say go for it. So I think the same is true with resilience. I love Mindy, that you started us off with, you got to do what you love. That's why we're here right now, is because I'm doing what I love, mm -hmm. which is talk about soil <laughs> a whole lot. <laughs> I got a really dirty mind. Yes, very soiled. Um, I spent my morning working with sixth graders uh, looking at a year's worth of compost data, um, and as we get ready for our soil science unit and, and stuff for. Um, so do what you love, and, and moving resilience, um, I think one step is great, but in an emergency situation, in everything we do, can we move it one step more toward the world that we know we need and the world that we want to see? Can we support Mari and all the other farmers in the room? And it's not supporting like, I'm going to support you because you're doing cool stuff. It's like, you're growing important food that I need. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's not about like charity. I see that a lot, uh, in, especially in the farming world. We're like, oh, we're going to subsidize farmers. It's like, farmers work so hard. Let's just buy, buy their food. <laughs> we don't have to, you know, we don't have to support. So again, thank you so much for being here. The next one is in two weeks, April 24th. It's a Wednesday. Uh, two of our speakers are here now, Carl Tiedemann and Henry Swayze. We'll also have Jan Lambert and uh, Judith Schwartz, who are two of our featured authors in the series, and their books are also in the raffle. And then again, two weeks after that will be our May 8th. If you want to get the notes and you haven't been getting them, please leave me your email. And um, I also want to ask you to please consider filling out a survey because we keep forgetting to ask you. And it's really actually important for us to be able to show our funders what we've done and ask for more money in the future so that we can continue to bring you things like this and do things together. Um, so please fill out a survey. Thanks so much.